The format table command can not only accept a list of property names that you want to display, it can also accept a hash table or associative array of custom columns. Here's how you do it. An at sign and then a curly brace, label equals whatever you want the column header to be labeled, semicolon, expression equals, and then whatever expression you want to be calculated using dollar sign underscore to represent the current object, and then you end the hash table. This is really, really cool, but why would you do it? Well, it allows you to display calculated columns. This is a lot easier to pro for producing things like uh, ad hoc reports and stuff than actually creating a custom type extension that has a script property. That takes a lot of work. Creating a simple calculated column using format table, not so difficult. So the expression you specify is calculated on a per row basis. And again, you're gonna use that dollar sign underscore variable in your expression to refer to the object represented by the current row. That way you can calculate based on values from the current row. Uh, it's probably easier to see this in an example. Here, I'm using WMI to retrieve the Win32 logical disk class. I'm piping that to format table, and I'm selecting the device ID property and creating a custom column. My column name will have a label of size, and the value will contain the current object's size property divided by one megabyte and cast as an integer to remove the fractional portion of the number. Notice that dollar sign underscore is used to refer to the current object. Next, I'll do the same thing, but this time I'm going to create a more complex expression for a column named drive type. I've created a switch construct that switches on the object's drive type property. If it's two, I'll output removable. If it's four, I'll output network. Three is for hard disk and five is for optical. You have to be careful about properly nesting all of these curly braces, but running the command proves that it works and illustrates a useful purpose for custom table columns. Progress bars in PowerShell displays a text designed or text based progress bar right within the shell's console window. Now, whether or not things get displayed depends on the state of the progress preference variable. That's a built in variable, and it must be set to continue in order for the progress bar to actually display. When you display a progress bar, you specify the name of the activity which is taking place, maybe uh, copying a file or, or something like that, uh, the current status, either the percent complete or the number of seconds remaining, and there are some other parameters such as the name of the operation, uh, when it's complete, and so forth that you can specify. Now, when do you show progress? Well, whenever you're gonna do something that's gonna take more than a few seconds. In other words, if you're running a script, and that script is going to reach out and connect to a hundred computers. Progress is a way of letting whoever's watching the script know that everything's going okay. It's happening. It might be taking a while, but things are okay. Otherwise, your script just kind of sits there and you're not sure if it's working or not. So typically, if you're in any kind of a loop, like a for each loop, or, or if you're inside of a filtering function that's using a process script block, anytime you're doing something repetitive, let's take a look. I'm going to begin in the shell with this one liner. This is a great illustration, by the way, of the fact that you can use PowerShell's scripting language constructs at the command line. I'm creating a for loop that will count from zero to 10. Each time through the loop, I'm creating a progress bar. After that, I'm having the script sleep for one second, just so we can see this in action. Running it, you can see that the progress bar is created and it does count down exactly as desired. After it finishes, I'm going to run more or less the same command again. This time, though, I'm telling the progress bar to display a percentage indication. After the bar, I'll have the script sleep for one millisecond. This one will go by quickly, since the script is only counting from 0 to 1,000, meaning it'll run in about one second. Running it, you can see the percentage bar increase until the script completes. Here in PrimalScript, I've taken that second command and formatted it a bit more nicely. However, these are the same instructions. And running it, I can see that PrimalScript provides a full implementation for this progress bar. PowerShell has a really cool formatting operator called dash F. It allows you to replace special tokens within a string with pieces of data. And that piece of data can just be simple values or it can be expressions. And those pieces of data can be formatted, dates, numbers, and so forth, using special formatting directives. This is often way easier to operate than taking little bits of strings and concatenating them all together. Let's take a look at what it, what it actually looks like and how it works. Here's how simple token replacement works. 
a string includes two tokens, numbered 0 and 1, in curly braces. That string is followed by the dash f operator and then by a comma separated list of values to be inserted where the tokens go. You could also pass in an array, since PowerShell treats comma separated lists as arrays anyway. The result is that the replacement values are inserted at the location of the tokens. This is a lot easier than concatenating strings and allows your string information to be well formatted and easier to read. So that's the syntax of the F operator. First, a static string containing numbered tokens. The first token is numbered 0, not 1. That's important. Then the dash F operator. And then after the operator, one or more pieces of data. Those can either be in an array or they can be in a comma-separated list. Because remember, PowerShell always treats comma-separated lists as arrays. Tokens, like zero in curly braces, can be followed by a colon and a .NET formatting directive, which tells the Dash F operator, hey, when you stick data in here, here's how I want it formatted. Today is zero, colon, lowercase d, Dash F, get date. That says take get date, whatever comes back from it. It's going to be a date, of course stick it in here and format it as a particular type of date. Now, the thing you have to remember is that there are parentheses around this get date command line, and those are required in order to make PowerShell treat it as an expression. In other words, it's going to force it to actually execute get date, take the result, and put that inside the token. So here are your basic formatting directives. Lowercase d is a short date. Uppercase d is a long date. Lowercase and uppercase T are a short or long time. Uppercase N is a general number, which is two decimal places. N3 would be three decimal places. N0 would be zero decimal places. You can probably imagine more. Um, F is a floating number, and it's the same thing. By default, it's two places, but F3 will give you three places and so forth. Let's take a look. So let's start with a simple example. I've created a string which includes a single replacement token, which is to be formatted as a date. I follow that with the dash F operator and then a date. In this case, I'm using the get date commandlet to produce a date. Notice the parentheses around get date. Those force PowerShell to actually execute the commandlet and use its output, which is a date, as the replacement value. Without the parentheses, the string get dash date would be used. Try it sometime and you'll see what I mean. Next up is a string with two replacement tokens, one formatted as a date and the other as a number. I'm passing in a date from get date and a literal numeric value, and you can see how the formatting works to make the number nicer looking. Finally, I'll use a simple string to replace two string values. Again, this is an easier way to construct a string that uses values from, say, a variable, and is much easier and more efficient to read than concatenating strings and variables together. Many .NET Framework classes can be used within Windows PowerShell. These provide useful functionality, which otherwise you really wouldn't have within the shell. It's a great way to do things like interact with the network, um, mess around with things like DNS, and so forth. Let's take a look at a really good example, which is pinging. In this and other courses, I've used WMI to perform a ping. But this method is actually a bit easier. By using the system.net.networkinformation.ping object, I have access to a send method, which sends a single ping, one ping only. This method returns a true or a false, depending on whether the address is pingable or not. If you want to check and see if a TCP port is open on a remote computer, you basically have to try to open a connection to the port and then check for an error in the event that the port wasn't open after all. You'll use the system.net.sockets.tcp client class, passing an address and a port. You'll either get back an object representing the open connection, if it works, or you'll get back an object equal to null, dollar sign null in PowerShell terms, if the port wasn't available. For a quick way to send an email, use the system.mail.smtp client class, giving it the address of your SMTP server to create a new SMTP client. Use that resulting object to execute the send method, providing a from address, to address, subject, and body. Note that SMTP servers requiring authentication can't use this short trick, although there is a longer technique you can use if authentication is necessary. I'll start by creating a new ping object and then sending a ping to localhost. Always a good test, and I see that it works. To test the opposite, I'll ping an address that I know doesn't exist, and I get false, as expected. 
Next, let's try to open a TCP socket. I've provided a server name and a TCP port, 80, to try. I get back an object either way. What I need to do in order to see if the port opened is compare that object to dollar sign null. True, meaning the object is null, means the port isn't available. False, meaning the object is not null, means the port is available and it was able to open the connection. Finally, I can send an email by creating a new SMTP client object and giving it the name of an address or IP address of my mail server. This server name, however, isn't available on my network. I want you to see what happens when you provide a bad or unreachable address. If the mail server had been available, I'd be able to use the send method to send a message. However, since it isn't, I do get an error message here. If you're familiar with component object model or COM objects that you've perhaps used with VBScript or another language, you'll be happy to know that you can use those same objects in PowerShell. Just use the new object commandlet. Give it a COM parameter and provide the parameter with the prog ID or program ID of the COM object that you want to create. You then assign that COM object to a variable and use the object just as you're accustomed to doing in other languages. Let's take a quick look. I'm going to create a new instance of the wscript.network com object and then use its map network drive method. One thing to note is that methods always require parentheses around their arguments, even though other languages like VBScript would not use parentheses here. Once the drive is mapped, I can launch Windows Explorer to prove that it's there, unlike a PS drive, which is visible only in PowerShell. All right, let's talk about capturing output. Commandlets, remember, always place their output objects in the pipeline. You can also capture the output to a variable. This does not suppress output going to the pipeline. So by capturing output, you specify the output variable parameter for any commandlet, any commandlet. Even if the help doesn't say it, it supports it, trust me. The alias for this is dash ov. You then specify the variable you want. Now when you do this, in addition to the commandlet's output going to the pipeline, the commandlet's output goes into the variable you specify. Here's an example. One last demonstration. I'm going to run get service, but I'm going to specify the dash ov parameter and a variable name. Notice that the variable name doesn't get a dollar sign here, just the name. The command runs normally, putting its output objects into the pipeline as usual. However, the output was also copied into the variable I specified. So if I view the contents of that variable, I have the output right there. Now, when is this useful? Well, one way is to capture the output from each command of a complex pipeline into different variables so that you can view each command's output independently after the entire command line executes. It's a great way to debug one-liners, in fact. Pause this video and take some time to complete this lab. Use the lab guide included on this disk to guide you through the lab tasks. When you're finished, resume this video and I'll present a sample solution. You'll also find hints and solutions right in your lab guide. Let's see how you did for this lab. I started by creating a function called ping port. Now, I want to be clear that my intended output for this function was just text, not objects. That's not something I usually do, but in this case I wanted to focus on the functionality of this script and text output is often easier. In fact, I often write functions that output text and then later go back once they're working and change them to output objects. All right, so with that disclaimer out of the way, let's see what I did. I started by defining three parameters, an address, which can accept an array of computer names or IP addresses, a starting port, and an ending port. I then created an output template, a set of strings for the IP address status and for the status of a port. These contain replacement tokens that I can use later to insert data. For pinging, I created a new system.net.networkinformation.ping object. Then I go through each address that was provided in the addresses parameter. I display a progress bar so that the user can tell what's going on. In it, I'm displaying the current address that I'm checking. I start by seeing if I can ping the address. If not, I output my IP status template, inserting the address and the phrase not reachable. If I can ping it, I go through the TCP ports that were specified. Because a closed port will result in an exception, I'm defining a trap handler that simply continues execution. I then calculate the percentage of completion that I'm at based on the number of ports I have to try and use that to display an updated progress bar. Then I actually attempt to connect to the port using a system.net.sockets.tcp client object. If the port connects, I display status information about the open port. 
Finally, my script simply calls the function with a test address, attempting to check TCP ports 1 through 1024. There were a lot of ways you could have approached this lab, and as long as you got the desired results, you should consider your result to be correct.